All right, section 1.4 is called Continuity and its Consequences. Um, I've already alluded to continuity once today um, when we talked about polynomials. So what we're going to do first is we're going to think about the following real-life functions, each of which is a function of the independent variable, time. An object, the height of a falling object, the amount of money in a person's bank account, and the cholesterol of a person. Which of these are continuous functions, intuitively, and which ones are not, and why? So, we have the height of a falling object, we have a person's cholesterol levels, it's a blood, blood level, right, and then we're looking at something medically, um, and we have the amount of money in a person's bank account. Somebody tell me one of them that you think is continuous. Okay, which one? Height of a falling object. Why do you think a height of a falling object is continuous? Okay, so can you define discrete or can you talk about what you mean by that? Because you're right. Continuous would be that at any given point decimals. That's one way to think about it. You would have any real number, right? So the height of the falling object is the one we can visualize the best. We've got a really good picture of this in our mind. So if I drop the pin, there's no way for it to go from here to here without passing through every single point in between, right? That's what it means to be continuous. You can't just jump from here to here, all right? Beam me up, Scotty, doesn't work. Okay, we can't do that. That's continuous. If you think about that intuitive definition, what else of those three examples is continuous? The cholesterol levels. For exactly the same thing, your blood sugar, a lot of the things. I mean, so if, if you're looking at what's happening with your cholesterol, you can't go from a cholesterol level of, I don't even know what's appropriate, but from one number to another number without passing through all the numbers in between. It doesn't just jump. It might go up quickly, uh, but it doesn't jump. It doesn't just instantaneously do that. Your bank account's not like that. Why? You can take money out. Yes. I can go to the bank just like I did yesterday and I can withdraw a big sum of cash or a small sum of cash, actually any sum of cash, and it instantly makes my money go from one number to another number without passing through every number in between, right? Not only that, but with money, it's discrete anyway. This the example or the language that Snyder used. It's discrete anyway because money has a finite number of decimal places. I can't get every real number in between $20 and $20.01. There, there are no numerical money values in between. So that also causes a problem. So we're talking about continuity. And here's our actual technical definition of continuity. Continuity says, for a function f defined on an open interval containing x equals a, we say that f is continuous at a when the limit, as x approaches a of f of x, equals f of a. Otherwise, f is said to be discontinuous at a. Okay, now we, we ran into this description, but we didn't actually stop and say it last section. We had two problems where I said, remember, but notice we really can't plug in the number three. We really can't plug in the number zero. We're sort of avoiding plugging it in by canceling something out, but we really can't plug it in, right? It really isn't a part of the graph. We have a hole there. Do you remember all that language that I was using? Okay, well, that's what this is saying. This is saying if I can't have the actual function value, what you see happening over here, that actual function value, then you have a location where it's discontinuous. And that's exactly what holes are. Holes are locations where there's discontinuities. Now, they're not the only thing. Holes are a problem. But what else is a problem for something to be discontinuous? There's at least two others. Sharp turns don't have discontinuity problems. They've got other problems we'll encounter later, but it's not sharp turns. Jumps in a graph, right? So if I have a graph where there's an actual physical jump between it, that's obviously a continuity issue. There's one more, though. You guys know what we talked about at last class. Asymptotes. Yeah, that's another spot. 
So if we have asymptotes going like this, or I didn't quite do that right with my hands, but you know, like going like, I can't do it. I can't do it today. There we go. That, was, that worked. If I do that, right, I don't actually arrive at a value. I can't plug in this number that's the asymptote location. So asymptotes are another continuity issue. All right, we're going to do these two examples. Um, we won't be able to do any group work today, but we will do next time. I'll make sure that we stop early enough to do some group work next time. Um, section 1.3 is the only homework you're going to have over the weekend, so it is just one section because we're not going to finish this one. But. All right, let's do these couple of examples before we call it quits for today, though. Determine where f of x or f is continuous. It says, if possible, extend f to a new function that's continuous on a larger domain, which sounds a little bit awkward. It's actually a lot easier than they made it sort of sound, but it sounds awkward. All right, so let's do the first thing first, though. Determine where f of x is continuous or f is continuous. The catch is we don't really ask ourselves, where is it continuous? We look at it and we say, where is it not? It's a much easier question to ask. What value or values am I not allowed to use in this function? Negative 1. It's a denominator issue on this one, right? Cannot put in the x value of negative 1. So we're going to talk about where this is continuous. We're going to talk about it being continuous everywhere but there. So this is continuous from negative infinity to negative 1. I'll write this in a couple of ways union negative 1 to infinity. This tells us the whole number line, but exclude the number negative 1. If you don't want to use interval notation, there's nothing that's going to make you do that right now. Nothing here says that it has to be done this way. You could actually physically write down all x values where x does not equal negative 1 in words or with a little bit of notation there at the end, something like that. Okay, so that's answering the first question. The second question starts talking about this extend business, right? What is it asking us to do? Well, what it's really asking us to do is, it's asking us, is there any way to eliminate that problem spot? Which sounds an awful lot like we did in the last section, and when we did what? Factoring. So we're going to look back at the problem and ask ourselves, is there a way to simplify and factor this so that we eliminate that problem spot? And on this one there, in fact, is. Well, how, how can we factor that numerator? Yeah, x plus 1 and x minus 1. And then what will happen? Yeah, we can eliminate or just uh, simplify, reduce, divide out, whatever word you want to use, x plus 1s. So our extended function, and your book actually does this in a different way. Let me just warn you right now. If you look in the back of the book, it's going to do something different than I'm about to show you, and it does it more complicated. So I like this approach a little bit better. This new function, which I should not call the same name as the old function. Please don't call it the same name. Give it some other letter. I'll call mine g of x. My new extension function is exactly what remains after I did my factoring. In my case right now, this is x minus 1. That is my new extension function. And we're done. That's not bad, right? It's just the simplification of it. I will promise you, you look in the back of the book on this problem, it's not going to say this. They write it differently, but it means the same thing. Okay? Let's try one more. Any questions on this one before I move on with it? I'm sorry. Okay, let's try one more. Um, Similar equation to the last one. What's different? It's upside down. I made, it, I made a reciprocal, actually, right? I did the inverse or something like this, depending on the language you're used to using. Yeah. Um, it's the same function, really, just flipped, right? Same values on top and bottom, but switched. All right, so we actually have seen this just a moment ago, but we've got a new denominator to contend with. What values here make this discontinuous? Negative 1 and 1, both of them, right? All right, so this is continuous. And I'm going to write it in interval notation because I think you might not have seen this one quite as frequently as the other one. It says negative infinity to negative 1, union, negative 1 to 1, union, 1 to infinity. If you don't like it, that's OK. You can do the same thing that we did on the last one where you say all x values, x not equal to plus or minus 1. That's perfectly fine. 
Those are the continuity values. Now, don't just say x does not equal 1 and negative 1. That's not okay. You need to say it can't equal everything else as well. That part has to be in there in some fashion. All right, we've already factored this a moment ago. So we already know that this factors as x plus 1 over x plus 1, x minus 1, right? All that's good to go. So when we did this before, but flipped, we recognized that we could Yeah, cancel the x plus 1. Do be careful. That leaves you still with a numerator. It's not nothing in the numerator or, or disappears. It still has a 1 in the numerator. But it means that our new extension function that we can create, g of x or h of x or k of x or whatever you like, is going to be 1 over x minus 1. And that's our extension fact, uh, function. Maybe I should pause just a second. I've got two more minutes left anyway and talk about why that means that's an extension function. The reason that's an extension function is it because it removes the location where I have a hole. This new equation that I just created does not have a hole at the x equals negative 1 spot. It's smooth and continuous through x equals negative 1. This previous one, same thing. It removed the problem spot of x equal negative 1. I no longer have a line with a hole in it at x equal negative 1. I just have a plain old line filled in. It's nice and continuous now. Now, this one's still not continuous everywhere, right? It still has a location that I can't use, but it has fewer discontinuities than the previous problem. Do you see the difference? So that does, in fact, make it an extension of what we had before.